God is building in me right now an understanding of single-mindedness. He's kind of taking me in a little deeper. And one of the ways he's doing that is through body metaphor. I really encourage you guys. I know that it seems a little weird and it might seem like you might not get how this is biblical until you actually do it. But you can't deny that God speaks in parable regarding our bodies. So why would he not speak into our bodies? And as it is, Elihu talks about this in Job 33, that God is speaking in many different ways. We're just not perceiving it. And then he goes through many of the different ways in which he is speaking. So if you have any question as to how this fits within the Bible, how, how this is biblical, how is God doing this, ask me those questions. I have no problem answering them. But it is so important, and I spoke with someone this morning who's experiencing some pretty serious things. Like God was speaking to her previously through things that he was sending in her body, and now he's starting to get louder. And the consequences of her not listening or not receiving what he's talking about are getting more significant, more serious. And that's what he's going to do. I mean, he has told you if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, okay? So he's not going to spare any part of you at the expense of your salvation. If you're not listening, he will get louder. If you're not returning, he will get louder, and the consequences will get more severe. One of the things that God has been talking with me about is that we need to be occupied by him. We cannot be playing with the world. We cannot be teetering that fence trying to be friends with the world and friends with him committing adultery with the enemy of Christ. Because when we start doing that, we start to be occupied by the world, by the spirit of the world. We start to think differently, we start to behave differently, and we start to speak differently. And he was showing me that at the very beginning, when he first started drawing me to himself, wooing me to himself, that there were certain things that he would tolerate. He would actually wake me up at 4.30 in the morning. I would go outside, I would sit with my journal, and I would just listen to what he was saying to me. I would just listen and I would write things down and I would do what he told me to do. I would examine what he was convicting me to examine inside of myself. I would repent. I would change I would do engage in this process with him and his voice was so clear. I could not deny that he was the one taking me through these things. But then I would go about my day and I would start to watch shows and and I didn't know any better at the time. But I would watch shows. I would then research on Google. I was writing the book that he told me to write, the one that I scrapped that I threw away, the first one. And the reason I threw it away is because of this very issue. I was not single-minded. I didn't know how to be single-minded. He had to teach me how to be single-minded. What I was doing is I would write down the things that he, would ha- that he was teaching me to do in order to heal, in order to repent, in order to return to him. But, and then I would write the book, but my training, my training in academia, my training as a doctor, right, wise in my own eyes, was I need to substantiate by the world the things that I'm saying, not by scripture. Scripture wasn't enough, right? I had to substantiate by the world. So some expert had to have done this before me. Otherwise, it wasn't valid. That's what the world teaches. Why do you think there's such a regurgitation of the schemes of the devil in academia and in research? It is so insidiously dangerous, and we don't even realize it. That's what we hold up as knowledge. So disgustingly dangerous that anything that we are substantiating with scripture or by God's spirit or by divine revelation, it's seen as foolish and completely discounted. So these are the things that I was doing, and and by the way, Part of what I was doing because I was substantiating by the world was adding in things that were completely foolish, chakra stuff. I mean, the world would rather hear about that stuff than the actual truth of God. Even Christians, even those who identify themselves as Christian, I can tell you that emphatically because there were times when I was teaching that garbage and people were just soaking it up. They loved it. And when I started to teach them about what God's word actually says, they would say things like, that's too much work. I don't think the Bible is practical for healing. I saw it firsthand. Firsthand, I saw it. So the ridiculous things that the world teaches are more are seen as more legitimate 
than the things that God has taught us since day one. The creator of all things, the healer of all people, single-minded. We have to be single-minded or we're going to be handed over to delusion. And so he was teaching me that at the very beginning. And I wrote that book and I wrote it. I think it took me a year and a half to write that first book. I sent it off to the editor and the second book, he didn't even have me use an editor because editors try to change the content. He didn't want anyone having any hand in what he had me writing. So I had sent that off to the editor, and by the time I got it back, he had already let me know that it was garbage. So I paid an editor to look at it, and I think he was testing the editor, to be honest, because I knew that person, and they claimed to be religious, and they, didn't, they, they were not willing to stand on the actual truth and say, I'm not the right person to edit this because I don't believe the things that you're saying. They weren't willing to do that. They sold out for the money. I can tell you right now that if I was editing someone's book who was talking about stuff like that, I would have said, I'm not the right person for this. I would have sucked it up or even said, okay, these are, the, you know, actually I would have sucked it up, but anyone can say, you know what? I've gotten this far into this. Here's how much time I've invested in this. I will give you my notes thus far, but I don't think that I'm the right person to proceed on this because I don't believe these things that you're saying. Why would a Christian not be willing to do that? So like I said, I believe that God te was testing that person to see if they would actually stand, to see if they would actually be a watchman. Shame on them. Over and over and over, that's what I find in counterfeit Christianity. People are not willing to stand. They're not willing to say, you know what? I understand that this is something that you believe, but it's not true. And let me show you where. Let me show you where God talks about this in the word. So God placed me in a position where I had spent all of this time. And, you know, no doubt the world would have said they would have wanted that book more than they want the books that I have written. But God had built me to a point, And then he was placing me in a position of deciding what's it going to be? Is it going to be the world? Are you going to sell out? Because I've proven myself to you. Are you going to sell out and go back to that? Because that's what gives you notoriety. That's what gives you glory. That's what gives you status. That's what the world takes seriously. Or are you going to speak on my truth and what I've proven to you? He was teaching me how to be single-minded. And today he's reminding me about that. And what he's showing me is that because I kept returning back to the world, because I kept returning back to research and speaking on that authority and trying to substantiate by that authority, I ended up very, very confused. And what was occupying me and what came out in that book was double-mindedness. I'm speaking about what God's doing, but then I'm also speaking on the authority of the world. And God will let that happen for a little while in order to give you a choice, in order to move you into making a choice. Are you going to be hot or cold? Otherwise, I will spit you out of my mouth. And he was doing that with me. And thank God he moved me to make the right decision to throw away that book. And he told me, you are going to write a different book. You're going to write a different kind of book. You're going to write it based on the authority of the word and my spirit and the testimony that I build inside of you and nothing else. And in fact, if you've read those books, you, sp you see that I speak against the very credentials that I received in the world. I even asked him when I was going to publish the book, do you want me to put my picture on there? Do you want me to put the title of doctor? The only reason I did that is because I know that the hearts of man are going to be attracted to that expertise. They're going to think that there is something important in there because I have doctor before my name. And I'm here to tell you that that's the opposite of the truth. I speak against those very credentials. I speak against that training. And all that did, that higher education did, was confuse me and make me a child of the devil. By the mercy and the sovereign choice of God, he rescued me from that pit of hell. It wasn't true. It never led to healing. And it speaks on the authority of the world in total opposition to Christ. And it would be more interested, even what is called Christian therapy, is more interested in speaking on satanic authority than on the authority of God, more interested in speaking on chakras and all of this woo-woo pagan satanic garbage. You think I'm being, you think I'm exaggerating? Check out the origins of mindfulness. Mindfulness has origins in Buddhism and Hinduism. Check out the things that Freud and Jung were into. Listen to what Freud says. Listen to that nonsense about the id, the ego, and the superego, a rewrite of flesh, 
Satan and the Holy Spirit completely confuses your understanding of your spiritual condition as a result of the curse. And if you don't understand what your condition is, you will never understand how to heal. I was speaking with a friend yesterday who has a nine-year-old son. The developmental stage of a nine-year-old boy is so incredibly precious. They are so interested in justice and what is true and what is good, and they really want to do the right thing. Their hearts are so precious. And in a couple years, they are going to be very vulnerable to being influenced by the world. Changes are going to start going on in their bodies. Developmentally, they're going to start thinking for themselves and becoming more and more independent. And the word says, train up your child in the way that they should go so that when they are older, they will not depart from it. Well, what happens when they're older? Well, they start thinking for themselves. You can't control them forever. You can't tell them what to think forever because developmentally, they need to be able to think for themselves and have that personal accountability. And we were talking about the things that his days are filled with, the things that he's doing and occupying himself with. We were talking about holidays, the holidays of the world versus holy days of God. Valentine's Day, which is coming up, St. Valentine's Day, right? Catholic holiday. What does the Antichrist try to do? Get you to celebrate the holidays of the world rather than the holy days of God. Tries to get you to forget his appointed times and his holy days. And frankly, our flesh would rather celebrate the holidays because what do you do? You get to eat really bad food and justify it. Well, it's the holidays. I'll lose, I'll lose the weight later, right? You're drinking more. You're just, you're indulging the flesh incessantly on these holidays. God's holy days are not celebrated that way. They're not observed that way. You know, even if you think of like the day of atonement, there are days where you're rejoicing, such as the festival of tabernacles, but then there's the day of atonement where you're withholding from yourself. And so these holidays are observed completely differently. You would never observe one of God's holy days as one as the world observes holidays. As the world observes holidays that they claim to be Christian, such as Easter and Christmas. You go study Leviticus 23, the holy days that God has established and how he talks about celebrating, observing those holy days, and you tell me which of those holy days is observed as any one of these holidays in the world. And the question that is he asked his mom is, well, can't we just celebrate Valentine's Day to God? Very sweet, very sweet little boy. I mean, I, I get to hear some of the things this precious child says. And yet if you don't have parents who are setting a good example, who are being shepherds, who are living spiritual lives themselves, who are living in congruence with God and are being led by God to raise his kids that he put on loan to you, you're going to go along with that thinking. This is a little child. He needs guidance. He needs to understand that the way that God commands us to observe his holy days are not the same as the world leads us to, to observe holidays. And if you start indulging that, if you start being double-minded and saying, well, we can celebrate Christmas, we'll just celebrate it to Christ. <laughs> okay. We can celebrate Valentine's Day, we'll just celebrate it to God. Then you're going to start justifying it and your heart is going to be led into deception and delusion because you didn't love truth. And so one of the things I was telling her is there's got to be a replacement. There just has to. You can't, and you think about the things that God calls you to do, the things he convicts you of that you're doing wrong. If you don't have, if you just say, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore, and you don't examine your heart, and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing differently, you're going to go right back to that thing or another version of it. And the reason why is because you're not orienting your heart toward him. You're just deciding to, be, to make a unilateral decision in and of yourself and to be occupied by self. And you're not occupied by self. You were made as a vessel. So he needs this understanding. It's not enough to just look at Valentine's Day and say, okay, look, these are pagan orig origins of, of Valentine's Day. These are the things that people are doing when they're observing Valentine's Day. He also needs, and we also need, to be able to look and say, all right, these are the things God doesn't want me to do. What are the things he does want me to do? And can I implement more rejoicing? If what I'm needing is rejoicing, then how do I implement more rejoicing? But how do I do it to God? 
because we're supposed to be, whether we're eating or drinking, we're supposed to be glorifying him in all we do, in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts, in our actions. Is there a way in which I can rejoice each week on Sabbath? Maybe I make a special meal on Friday, on Thursday or Friday in preparation for Sabbath that I can enjoy. Maybe with my child, I'm making a meal and I'm teaching him about the harvests. We're going out and we're picking that food. Or even if we're just going to the grocery store, what's the harv- What's in season right now? What does God talk about with regard to grapes? What does he talk about with regard to wheat? So that we're now orienting our hearts continuously to what God has talked about so that when we read that in the word, now we know it in physical experience. Now, one of the things that he was telling me today is that our flesh is, And what we've learned in the world to do is going to constantly take us away, constantly trying to occupy us by what the world values and what our flesh desires. Distraction, stimulation, curiosity. Oh, I don't buy into Hollywood, but let me just see what they're up to. Let me just see about so-and-so's divorce or I don't know, any number of things that they're doing, right? When something comes up on the news. And the more we occupy and the more that we expose ourselves to those little things, we start to, it's like a gateway drug, right? It just pulls us in. And now our minds are occupied, our behaviors are occupied, our words are revealing what's in our hearts. These are the things we're thinking about. These are the lyrics that are running in our minds, that earworm. We can't be occupied with that stuff. One of the things that she that my friend was telling me is that, you know, once a week that she allows her son to, you know, do the Xbox or, you know, do electronics TV Xbox, but for a, a little while. And I started thinking about that today. And, you know, the thing is that when we are occupying ourselves with those things, what's going to happen, and I know it's so mainstream, it's so normalized, it's so normal to just lay down and watch a show, but the mere introduction of these things is going to lead us to temptation. We're going to want that when we're sitting down and we're not feeling comfortable. We're not going to want to sit down and try to understand, why do I feel restless? Why do I feel uncomfortable? We're going to think, you know what? I want to watch a show right now. I just want to be able to veg out and therein starts the justifications when we are of age to make our own decisions, right? Because right now we have a very obedient, beautiful, precious little boy who wants to serve God, who is obedient, who's curious about the things of God. And it's like, you know, nine-year-old boys, like they learn what is right. And there's like no question, right? There's no question. It's just like, okay, then that's what we're going to do. No, you need to do that, mom, because This is what's right. This is what God wants you to do. That's their heart. How precious is that to God? And so the mere introduction of things that stimulate the flesh become that gateway drug so that when we make our own decisions, that's what we're going to gravitate toward. Unless we're being oriented to something different. Unless we're learning what we're supposed to be occupied with instead. I want you to consider that because anyone listening to this video is likely of age to make their own decisions. Pay attention to what these things do to you. You know, if you, if you can't discern, if you can't distinguish what these things are doing to you, you might need to fast so that you can then, when you re slowly reintroduce other things, then you can go, Oh my goodness. I had no idea how much control this had over me. I had no idea that when I'm waking up with those lyrics in my mind, when I'm thinking about those things that so-and-so is doing that I'm not supposed to be concerned about, who cares what Kim Kardashian's doing? Who cares what so-and-so's wearing? Who cares about, you know, whoever's divorce in media? But if I'm occupied by that and that's what I'm thinking about, I mean, good grief, how dumb. Every minute that I'm occupied by that is a minute that I could be occupied by what God is doing in me. And one of the things that he's doing in me today is he wants me to be excited about what he's building in me, not entertained by nonsense, nonsense that's going to pass away. What does any show or entertainment, what is that going to do inside of my soul? It's defiled food. 
I'm ingesting defiled food. And he's given me some physical symptoms to help me understand, to take me in just a little bit deeper and help me understand the defiled food that I've been ingesting. And let me tell you something, when you're doing body metaphor work, when you are first understanding what, how he manifests the spiritual condition of your soul through your mind and body, through these different aspects or your dreams or your thoughts, as you're coming to understand that, the devil's going to try to steal it away. He's going to try to convince you in your carnality, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. You just slept wrong. That's why you can't move your neck. You just ate something that you're allergic to. That's why you're having these reactions. He's going to try to do that so that you think this is foolish. You need to just keep doing it because God is going to reveal. You could have eaten any number of things and not had a reaction or had a different kind of reaction. Why is he speaking to me in this specific way? And why in such a specific way to what I have been doing, to what he's calling me to address? I could have slept wrong and injured my leg instead of not being able to turn my neck. You know what I'm saying? Like, The ways that he is affecting you are intentional. Nothing happens without God's sovereignty, without his plan. And he tells us that he doesn't give us grief willingly. So if we have grief, if we're feeling sensation or pain or discomfort, then he's speaking. And I was speaking with with someone this morning who had something that was going on inside of them, who was talking about it. And I said, please do body metaphor work on it so you can understand what he's calling you into. And I have a feeling that they didn't entirely take it seriously. I know this person's heart. I know that they will do it. But I also sometimes see that they don't always do it completely. And now he's sent something more seriously, more serious. He's going to get your attention. His voice is going to get louder. And let me tell you something. It's not enough for you to identify what God has said that he's saying, hey, you're ingesting, you know, defiled food as he's saying to me. I am required to examine what's going on when I feel like I want to distract myself. What's going on when I want to go to, you know, something that I know I'm not supposed to go to. I have to do that work. I have to also look at what am I going to do instead? What is it that God's calling me into? Because I have some feelings inside of me where I want to be occupied. I want to know more. I want to understand what's what God is doing, but how am I going to understand that? Am I going to understand that by looking at the news and then trying to figure out what he's doing, or am I going to understand it from him? There's a difference between trying to figure things out in my carnality versus receiving that directly from God, and that's why a lot of people are being handed over to deception and delusion by people who have YouTube channels and are not don't even understand the times, but are saying things like, "Oh, the you know, like one thing that I talked about on the channel, which was the river Euphrates drying up. Yes, it's already dried up, but that doesn't mean that we're in the bowls of wrath." Where's the Antichrist? Where are the witnesses? All of those things need to happen before the bulls of wrath are here. Furthermore, if it's the bulls of wrath, you missed the resurrection. And the resurrection isn't going to be a secret. Those bulls of wrath don't happen until after the resurrection. So for people to be saying this on YouTube is just simply without understanding. And the reason it's without understanding is because they're looking with their carnality in order to interpret the times rather than being taught and led by God's spirit, who's going to tell you what the times are, and he's going to confirm it within his word. So there's a difference. So I do have that desire in me. I want to be occupied. I want to know more. I want to know what you're doing, God. I want to, you know, a lot of times what we mistake as wanting to be entertained is actually a longing inside of us to know more. I want to know more. I want to feel that joy. I want to feel that clarity in God. And And because it's so easy for us to grab the TV, it's so easy for us to grab technology and go listen to someone else spoon feed it to us, right? It's harder to get into that posture and listen to what God wants to tell us. We think we have some sort of control. What's God doing right now? Like as though God's just a Google search and we can, he's a Google search away. We can just Google, what are you doing now? No, we have to get into position. It requires some work inside of us in order to do that. But most of the time, if not all of the time, that's what we're longing for. That's what we're wanting. And so when we start feeling these things, we need to be, we need to have something to replace it with. 
Otherwise, we're just going to automatically go to what we've been trained by the world to go to. Now, when I say that, I want you to realize it's exceedingly dangerous to train a child to go to those things. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to expose them to how easy it is to just go to the world to tell you how to think, to go to the world to entertain you. It would be a, it is a lot easier when your child is young to teach them. Think about how difficult it is for you now as an adult since you've been exposed to all these things. It is much easier when you have a young child to teach them how to be single-minded for God, how to get comfortable you know, pursuing his spirit, sitting with him, bringing yourself into posture, receiving from him. That's what our children need to be occupied with. Attunement within personal relationship and attunement to God who is inside of you. And we need to be explaining to our children how it is that God's people live versus how it is that the world lives so that they can make that decision and so that they can do it when they have this desire that this precious little nine-year-old has during that development. Do you understand how our development has been so thwarted by the things that we have been exposed to during precious stages of development that God gave us in order to know him, in order to obey him at times when it's like, that's all we're thinking about. You try to tell a nine-year-old, you try to do something wrong in front of a nine-year-old, they are going to call you out. They're going to tell you that what you are doing is wrong, that it is unfair, that it is unjust, and that it is wicked. But you do those things now in front of an adult, they're not going to say anything to you. You send your book off to an editor who claims to be Christian, they'll just take the money. They'll sell out. They're not going to stop and say, you know, what you're writing about is in total conflict to what I believe and in total conflict to the word of God. I know that we have this agreement, but ethically, I need to tell you, I can't be your editor for this book. No, adults are cowards. Adults are defiled by the things of the world. We justify it. It's business. What you are craving is not entertainment. What you are craving is satisfaction and edification. And the problem is that when you go to entertainment, then you go to the world to satisfy and edify you. And you might not think you're doing that, but you think about this. You watch a Hallmark video. You know, Hallmark, like I used to watch Hallmark all the time when God was first drawing me to him because I thought I was making the good choice. Oh, goodness. It's even more satanic because a lot of times claiming to be Christian, including pure flicks, right? I mean, when you claim to see and you're doing all this stuff, it's even worse because now you claim to see. God said that to the Pharisees, didn't he? If you didn't see, you wouldn't be guilty. But because you claim to see, you are guilty. How do these things edify you? They train you to think that you must have a husband or you're not you know, you're just lonely and a sad sap, always leading you to flesh kinds of uh, desires and fulfillments, even to the extent that every Hallmark movie takes place in a cupcake shop or some sugared up, you know, something or other. And we think that's sweet. Yeah, just keep baking defiled food, right? You know, this is defiled food. It's not whole food. Always enticing the flesh. And it's edifying you according to the standards of the world, even the standards of the world in counterfeit Christianity. What does love look like? What does tolerance look like? What does acceptance look like? Always edifying you according to the distorted and disgusting standards of the world. Your desire is good for edification, but you need to know where edification comes from. It comes from his spirit, not TV. Very, very dangerous. And it leads us to bondage. The minute that we start succumbing to that, it leads us to more compulsion. Compulsion. What, how do I feel at night? Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to have to process the things from the day, the things that I'm feeling uncomfortable about, the things that I'm struggling with. I just want to veg out. We say that, and we feel entitled to it. I just want to veg out. Why would we want to veg out on TV versus, uh, you know, reading the Word of God? The Word of God will wash us. The Word of God will give us peace. But television is going to repress all of that content. Everything that we're, you know, it's okay to say, you know what, I'll deal with these things in the morning. 
when I'm fresh and I'm able to sit down and really, you know, really journal this out and have the energy to do it. I do that. I'll, I'll tell God, you know what? I know the things that I need to, to examine. I'm going to do it in the morning. Cause I'm just, I'm, I'm fried right now. Like I'm, I'm done for the day, but there's nothing wrong with picking up the word and reading the word. God will compartmentalize. He will, you know, there's a difference between repression and suppression. Repression is when you stuff it down to not see the light of day. Suppression is when you say, you know what, right now I'm not going to deal with this because I'm going to set it apart aside. I'll make a little note in my journal that I need to pick this up in the morning because either it's not appropriate to deal with it right now or I just am not, I don't have the energy for it right now. Suppression is a good strategy repression is going to lead to bondage and compulsion. And I want you to know that if you keep repressing, it will turn into a spirit. You will be handed over to that spirit because in essence, what you are doing is you are rejecting the ministry of God. You're saying, no, I don't want to deal with these things. They're too uncomfortable. And God's saying, but I sent them to you because I'm building you through them. You need to deal with them and you need to be built by them. And you're saying, no, I don't want your ministry. Okay. God's a respecter of choice. You'll be handed over to that spirit because frankly, you don't occupy yourself. You are a vessel. You have to choose who you're going to serve and who you're going to be built and edified by. So when you start feeling that fear, when you start feeling that compulsion, when you can't get off the computer, when you are falling asleep to the TV because you can't tolerate any other thoughts, you need something to occupy you. You can't you can't deal with what's going on inside of you. You need to recognize that that is either turning into a spirit or it already is. Please, people of God, Learn to enjoy the things of God. Learn to enjoy and get comfortable with being filled by him and edified by him and satisfied and satiated by him to enter his rest while his opportunity to rest still stands. Let us make sure that we have not fallen short of it. If you are hearing the voice of God, don't be like our ancestors in the wilderness who rejected him and died. Because you keep doing that, eventually that is going to be the result. Remember that God rebukes the church for being lukewarm. He says, I wish you'd decide if you are going to be hot or cold. But since you have not, since you are lukewarm, since you have not made a decision whom you are going to serve, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Listen to the things that he's raising in you. Occupy yourselves with the things of God and teach your children to do likewise. And when they are older, they will not depart from it. When they are older, they're not going to struggle with the things you're struggling with right now because you will have trained them to be comfortable and to have that automatic default of, I need to go be with the Lord. One of the things that my friend said to me is that, Her son now says, you know, you go be with the Lord, mom. You go have your God time. Why is he using that language? Why is he saying that? Because he has an example of a godly mother who is showing him that this is what you do in a day, throughout the day. You don't go distract yourself. He's not saying to her, mom, go have some downtime. Go, you know, watch your show. No, this woman is setting a godly example for her son that you set apart time to really be with the Lord. And when you do that, you're not just ending that time. You're making that time intentional. And now when you're, when you're done w- you know, with that time that you have set apart, you are carrying him with you. You continue the conversation with him. I don't care whether you're cutting vegetables for dinner or you're bathing your children at night. You always have God in you. You fan into that flame. You continue to talk with him. Your child asks you a question. They're talking with you about school. You have that dialogue with God. God, how do you want me to bring you in to this conversation? Always glorifying God, whether you're eating or drinking or anything that you are doing, you bring him into it. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.